Well, let's continue on in worship. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to get it out. If you're visiting online, we'd love for you to also take out your Bible at home. It'll also be up on the screen. We continue on in our sermon series, God's Strength and Our Weakness. We're in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians on verse 2, and we're going to end in verse 16 to complete chapter 7. Let's hear from the Lord this morning. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness towards you, I have great pride in you, I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction I am overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within." But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while." As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourself innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. Therefore, we are comforted. And besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus has proved true. And his, and his affection for you is even greater, as he remembers the obedience of you all. How you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice, because I have complete confidence in you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given us the gift of repentance. The gift of seeing that our sin is, is wasteful, our sin takes us away from you, and rather that there is life and an abundant life in you. And so God, I pray and I, I ask this morning, God, that we would leave here, Lord, not as people that are just ready to go do our week, Lord, go do our grocery shopping, go do lunch, but a people that leave here as ones that have, our hearts have been convicted actually turn around from our sin, Lord. And so I pray for Pastor Trent, and I pray that he would continue to preach with this boldness, just as Paul wrote in this, this letter, God, I pray that he would deliver this message that you have been stirring on his heart this week to us, as we have ears, God, that are just ready to listen and ready to turn away from sin. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When I am weak and weary from the storm In the valley and when the night is long When other helpers fail and come Welcome to all of you to Covenant Church. Welcome to those of you joining us 
online again. Well, I have some good news for you today. In fact, the best news there is. Sin is the best news there is. Which is something unusual, of course, but it is 2020, so we come to expect those kinds of things. Sin is the best news there is. Maybe when you hear the rest of the quote, it'll make more sense to you. Sin is the best news there is, the best news there could be in our predicament. Because with sin, there's a way out. There's the possibility of repentance. You can't repent of confusion or psychological flaws inflicted by your parents. You're stuck with them. But you can repent of sin. Sin and repentance are the only grounds for hope and joy. The grounds for reconciled, joyful relationships. When you understand that your fundamental problem in this world is sin, it's good news because there's an answer for sin. God has provided a solution for sin, and the solution is to repent and believe the good news of the gospel, of what Jesus Christ has accomplished through his life and death and resurrection. It's an amazingly freeing thing to recognize that my fundamental problem isn't something out there. It's not something somebody else is doing. It's not who's in power. It's not something that's happened to me. My fundamental problem is my rebellion against God. But the good news is that God has provided a solution. And it's found in what we call repentance and faith. We're going to focus in on this understanding of repentance today. We're going to talk about what true repentance is and contrast it with a counterfeit. It's my hope that, as Pastor Chris prayed, we not simply understand it, but that we would actually embrace it and express it and live it. Now, in order to understand this, though, Paul couches his teaching about repentance in uh, teaching about a lot of other things. Really, it's a, it's a whole, there's a whole historical context we need to understand here. So if you just look with me in verse 2, Paul says, make room in your hearts for us. We've wronged no one, we've, been, we've corrupted no one, we've taken advantage of no one. And I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. In last week's passage, we saw how Paul was encouraging them to uh, not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, particularly having in mind the false apostles who had slipped into Corinth and were seeking to turn the people of Corinth against Paul, who's the very one who introduced them to Jesus. And so Paul is saying, you need to separate yourselves from those people because as long as you're aligned with them and you're aligned against me, you're aligned against Christ and his gospel. And so he's, in, he's inviting them to, to repent. They need to be reconciled to him and also be reconciled to God. And as he pleads with them in this passage, he's saying, make room in your hearts for us. There's, we, haven't, we haven't done anything to offend you. We haven't wronged you. We haven't taken advantage of you. In other words, all of the grounds for why you are rejecting us and siding with these false apostles, they're groundless. And like a parent to a child who's wayward, he says, Make your, open your heart to us. You're already in our heart. Our, our heart's open to you in death or in life. No matter what comes, our hearts are tied together. But won't you make room in your hearts for us? As is often said, you can only be as happy as your least happy child. And so also for the pastor, for Paul, for those in ministry. You only be as happy as, as you see your people flourishing with Jesus. And when they're in rebellion, his heart is broken over that. And so he's inviting them to reconcile with him, to be reconciled to God. Now, in verse 5, he, is, he connects us back to something he said quite a while ago. Actually, is all the way back in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. At the end of chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, Paul begins a digression. And we've been on a rabbit trail, essentially, for the last several months as we've worked our way through these passages. And he picks up the original thought right here in chapter 7, verse 5. Now, if we were reading the letter straight through, it would only have been a few minutes of digression. But since we're taking this a little bit of time, it's been months since we saw what Paul was talking about last. Well, he's pointing out uh, he's reminding them of their history. 
So let me remind you of it. Paul went to Corinth and he planted a church. He led these people to Jesus. He left the church under good care and went about planting more churches. Because that's what we're about, making disciples, making disciples, going around, starting churches and so on. Well, when he was gone, some problems arose in Corinth. And so Timothy, one of Paul's associates, comes and reports the issues that are happening there. Paul makes a visit to Corinth to address the issues, and what he finds is somebody there has, is particularly opposing him and offends him, and the rest of the Corinthians don't do anything about it. They don't address the sinner. Paul leaves, humiliated, with a commitment that he's going to come back and deal with the issue. But after leaving, he has second thoughts. And he decides that more effective than coming back in person would be for me to write a letter to the church. And so leaves Corinth, goes to Ephesus, and he writes what's called a tearful letter. We don't possess this letter, but we see it referred to a couple of different times here in 2 Corinthians. And the, the main point of the letter was to convict them of their sin against God and, secondly, against him. He refers to that letter here in this passage that, that we've just read. Well, after he sends the letter, he has some second thoughts because he says some hard things in this letter. And he says, I don't regret it now, but I regretted it as soon as I sent it, much like you might feel when you write a difficult email or text, and as soon as you send it, you say, oh my gosh, what should I do? <laughs> Where's the unsend button? Uh, so it was for the Apostle Paul. After he sent the letter, he went up to a place called Troas, where he was supposed to rendezvous with Titus, who had delivered the letter to Corinth. When he got to Troas, Titus didn't show up. So Paul's a nervous wreck. He's wondering what's happened to the Corinthians. How did they receive the letter? Why is Titus not here? Has something happened to him? Is he okay? You know, there's means of communication we have available to us they didn't have. Titus never comes to Troas, so Paul goes on north to Macedonia. That's the second rendezvous point. And it's there that he experiences what we read here in verse 5. He says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. This is Paul's condition. He's a, a minister of the new covenant gospel, and this is his condition. Fighting's without. He's experienced a, some kind of affliction in, in Asia that was so significant he thought he was on the point of death. He's dealing with his fears inside about what's happened to his, his partner Titus, what's happened with the church in Corinth. Are they going to respond to the message? Are they going to, is this going to make things worse? This is what he's experiencing there. And into that place, we read verse 6 and 7. But God, who comforts the downcast, so just to pause for a second and recognize, Paul is identifying himself here as one who is downcast. This is the same apostle who says, rejoice always. It's the same apostle who says, don't be anxious about anything. All of those things are true, but, but what Paul is highlighting in this letter is that he too is a man who, who experiences weakness in this world, in this life, and in this ministry and the ministry of the gospel isn't about his strength, but it's about God's strength being manifested through his weakness. And the same is true for you and me. You're going to experience weakness. You're going to experience seasons of being downcast and despairing, perhaps, even of life itself, as Paul says he did. But it's right in those places where we see God's strength come and be demonstrated. And Paul sees God's strength here in the form of comfort. And that comfort comes by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. So Titus shows up, and the very appearance of Titus comforts Paul because he is worried about his friend. And not only did he rejoice at seeing Titus, but the news that Titus brought. And the news that Titus brought is that the Corinthians received the letter and that they have repented. Their zeal for Paul to be reconciled with him, their longing to, to be with him, all of this was demonstrated to Titus. Titus brought the good news to Paul, and he finds himself immensely comforted, and yet he recognizes that the source of that comfort is God. 
It's him who comforts the downcast. And he does so frequently through the very hands and words of people that he puts around us in the body of Christ. But it is God who is the father of comfort, the God of all mercies. Calvin writes about this comfort. He says, hence a most profitable doctrine may be inferred. That the more we have been afflicted, so much the greater consolation has been prepared for us by God. The deeper our afflictions and the deeper our hurt and even the the deeper our being downcast, it's not too deep for God's comfort and consolation to reach. Our sorrows are never deeper than he is able to reach down and to minister to us comfort. And if you remember early in this series, we talked about that word comfort as it's used in 2 Corinthians, it's, comfort is a little bit soft for, what, for describing what God actually does. The, a better word is consolatory strengthening. There is a consolation that God extends to us by the ministry of the Spirit and through people. There is a, it's a, it's a, that, is, that is like comfort. But it also strengthens us. He, 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 puts, he puts something in our backbone that enables us to withstand the affliction and to continue pressing on and be faithful in the midst of the affliction, whatever its particular source or cause. This is the way God manifests his strength in the midst of our weakness. So Paul is delighted that they are repenting because where there is no repentance, there can be no lasting joy because there's no reconciliation with God or with man. In other words, without repentance, there can't be reconciliation. Apart from their repentance, Paul couldn't be reconciled to them. Apart from their repentance, they couldn't be reconciled to God. But because of their repentance, Paul rejoices in their reconciliation with God and with him. So that's what we're talking about now, repentance. That's sort of the background. But let's get into the heart of the matter. Repentance. Repentance is really central to the Christian life. If you're familiar with Martin Luther and the 95 Theses, which were kind of, kind of the hallmark of the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation, he posted 95 Theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg. And the first one said, when our Lord Jesus Christ called us to repent and believe the gospel, he intended for all of the Christian life to be marked by repentance. In other words, repentance is not just something we do the, f- the f- one time when we come to Jesus, but it's actually something that is a regular part of living out the Christian life. We might say that repentance and faith are the two steps of walking with Jesus. So we're going to talk this morning about, first, the impetus for true repentance. Uh, what is it that, that is the catalyst for real, tr- genuine Christian repentance in the life of a person? And there are two components to it. But let's look at verses 8 and 9 where we see them. He writes, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Two components to the, uh, the, for the impetus to repentance, and that is, first of all, loving confrontation with the truth. If there's going to be genuine repentance, we must first be confronted with the truth. And that's what Paul does through his letter. He sends them this letter outlining their sin. This is how you've gone astray from God. This is what you've done. And in the hopes that he's presented it in such a way that they hear it and respond with repentance. Paul intentionally chose not to go back in person to deliver this message because he thought it would be more effective to do it by letter. As I've reflected on that, I realized Paul is, his concern is not just to grieve these people over their sin, as he says. His concern is that they be grieved into repenting. And so as a good shepherd, he's thinking about how can I best help them get to the place where God intends for them to be. And this is what shepherding ministry in our church is all about, is how can we help God's people be in the place where God intends for them to be? It requires wisdom and thoughtfulness and speaking the truth in love. 
See, confronting sin and calling one another to repentance are at the heart of the process of sanctification in the life of the church. We don't grow in isolation. We grow in community with one another. Not only as we consider God's word, but as we consider its implications for each other. And sometimes what we need is a brother or sister in Christ to lovingly tell us the truth about ourselves, something maybe we don't see about ourselves, so that we can own it and turn away from it and walk in obedience in those parts of our life that maybe we're unaware of or maybe we just don't care. But love is required. You see, if we don't love one another, we won't speak the truth to one another. Because speaking the truth is hard, isn't it? (laughs) Because speaking the truth to you means now I might have to get involved in the mess. Speaking the truth to you means this may get worse rather than better. Speaking the truth to you means you might turn around and speak truth to me. Maybe that's my biggest fear. But love requires us to speak the truth to one another. But here's the other piece. If there's not love there, then we might speak the truth, but our intention isn't that they would repent. Our intention is to hurt. Our intention is to grieve. Not to grieve into repenting, but just to grieve you as you've grieved me, perhaps. But where love is, we can speak the truth. That may grieve the person, but it grieves them into repenting. That's what we want to aim for. So the first piece of repentance happening is a loving confrontation with the truth. That can happen even just when we're reading the Bible. Uh, It can happen as we're listening to messages. It can happen in many different kinds of ways. But, But the truth and recognizing that we're out of line with the truth or that we're moving away from the truth is the first piece. The second piece then that flows from that is a godly grief over our sin, not a worldly grief. We're going to look at the difference between a godly grief and a worldly grief that Paul describes for us in this passage. Look at verse 9. He says, I sent you the letter. It grieved you. And he said, but you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss from us. In other words, that godly grief did something good for you. The word godly grief literally means a grief according to God. And so trying to figure out what exactly that means, it may it most likely means a grief that is according to God's will and it essentially accomplishes God's purposes. And that's different from worldly grief. The Heidelberg Catechism describes godly grief this way. It is to grieve with heartfelt sorrow that we have offended God by our sin and more and more to hate it and to flee from it. One of the marks of godly grief is that it is a grief over having sinned against God. He is at the the heart of the grief, not we ourselves. And the effect of godly grief, as he says in verse 9, is that you are grieved into repenting. Now let's define repentance now because we've been talking about it over and over. You might be sitting there saying, what exactly is this? One theologian defines repentance this way. Repentance may be defined as the conscious turning of the regenerate person. That means a person who's been born again. uh, A regenerate person away from sin and toward God in a complete change of living, which reveals itself in a new way of thinking, feeling, and willing. A couple of things to notice about this. It involves turning. Uh, repentance is a turn. You're moving one way to repent is to turn and go another way. Specifically, sin is moving away from God and repentance is turning back toward him. And this theologian is careful and he's right when he says it is the action of a regenerate person. That means a person who's been born again. Repentance is not something you can do on your own. It is the effect of God's prior work of grace in your life. You repent because God in his grace is enabling you to do so. And he uses his word and others to to convict you to this point where you want to turn from sin. And not just that you want to turn from sin, but even more that you see the beauty of Christ and what he's done for you. And and you're turning to him in faith even as you're turning away from sin and repentance. But repentance is a gift. And that's why when you sometimes hear people say, at least I sometimes hear people say, I know God doesn't want me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I know that he'll forgive me 
when I repent. You see, that statement, now you may not actually say those words, but you might actually do that, and, and, and me too. But what we, what we are doing, we're presuming that we can just repent whenever we want to. That repentance is just something I can stir up within myself, and whenever I want to experience godly grief, I can just stir that up and, and feel it and actually repent. And that's a misunderstanding of what repentance is. Repentance is a gift of God's grace and the work of His Holy Spirit in your life. And we are foolish to grieve His Holy Spirit by willfully walking into sin, thinking that on the other side we'll just, we'll just repent of it. The same grace that enables you to repent later and enable you to walk in obedience right now. Verse 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly grief produces, it leads to repentance and salvation. Worldly grief doesn't. So let's talk about the distinction. How can you know if the grief you feel is godly grief or worldly grief? We can distinguish between the two in at least three categories. First of all, the object of godly grief versus worldly grief. In godly grief, the primary center of our grief has to do with the fact that we have sinned against God. In worldly grief, the center of our grief is ourselves and what we've done to ourselves. Godly grief mourns because we've sinned against him. Worldly grief mourns because I've made my life more difficult. Philip Hughes describes worldly grief this way. It's not sorrow because of the heinousness of sin as rebellion against God, but sorrow because of the painful and unwelcome consequences of sin. Self is its central point, and self is also the central point of sin. Thus, the sorrow of the world manifests itself in self-pity rather than in contrition and turning to God for mercy. So I know I'm experiencing worldly grief when after I've sinned, I'm feeling bad for myself. I've made my life more difficult. I I have to eat humble pie. Uh, I, I I made myself look bad in front of other people. I have to go and tell somebody I'm sorry. It's all about me, right? That's worldly grief, and it leads to death. Godly grief is concerned with God and his glory and his holiness. And we're grieved for what we've done to him. And the consequences to us are far secondary matter. Secondly, we can distinguish worldly grief from godly grief when it comes to the outcome. The outcome. We read already that godly grief produces a repentance, a turning from sin and to Christ that leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief produces death, and it does so by a number of different steps and paths. One of the paths that worldly grief produces, one of the effects it produces in us, is blame shifting. I've sinned. I'm grieved by my sin. But my heart also says, yes, I did this, but it was really because of what that other person did that I did what I did. Or if you hadn't have done what you did, I wouldn't have done what I did. This is really about you, not me, right? Or Adam in the garden, it was this woman you gave me. Or Eve in the garden, it was this snake that you put here. It's blame shifting, right? And, and, and Paul says that, that leads to death. That doesn't lead to Jesus. Secondly, minimizing. This is when we become aware of our sin some way or another. But instead of owning it and and acknowledging its terribleness, we say, yeah, I did do that, but it's not as bad as what so-and-so did. Yeah, I did do that, but I could have done this. And if you knew what I was going to do, you'd be glad it was only this. Or do we really need to make a mountain out of a molehill? I mean, this was just a small thing. We minimize our sin because we're measuring it against ourselves and what we think is good and right instead of evaluating it in light of the holy God. Thirdly, despair. Uh, 
This is when we've sinned and we know we've really blown it and maybe we've, we, we've fallen so far below our own expectations for ourselves that we actually despair of life itself. We don't see a way out. We don't see a way back because all we can see is ourselves. And rather than leading us to repentance, it leads us to death. There's some good, helpful pictures of these kinds of grief in the Bible. One of them is Cain. Cain kills his brother. God comes to him and he says, what have you done? And Cain basically shrugs it off. Minimal, min, he he minimizes. He's the first murderer. And he's like, meh. And after God hands down the punishment, what does Cain say? He doesn't say, I've sinned against God. He says, my punishment is more than I can bear. That's worldly grief. You can recognize that in yourself when you say, boy, it's not fair how I'm being treated as a result of what I did. It's not fair that, I, that I'm going to have to deal with this. That's... On the flip side of Cain, consider David. David stole a man's wife and then killed him. And when he was confronted with the truth by the prophet Nathan, and told that his child was going to die on account of his sin, David didn't say, my punishment is greater than I can bear. David said, I have sinned against God. That's godly grief. And it led him to repentance. Consider Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. And after betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he recognized he had messed up. But it wasn't godly grief. He went and he tried to give the money back to the, the, the priests who had paid him. They wouldn't take it. Judas despairing, perhaps embarrassed. We don't know what exactly he was feeling, but we know it was despair because rather than repenting and going to Jesus, he went out and hung himself because that's what worldly grief does. It leads to death. Consider Peter. Peter also betrayed Jesus, not once but three times. And after doing so, became aware of his sin and wept bitterly, the scripture says. But it was a godly grief for what he had done to Jesus. And it led him to repentance and to life and to a very fruitful ministry. You see, it's not a matter of the, the, the greatness of your sin. It's a matter of, is your sorrow of it primarily oriented toward yourself or does it lead you to run to Jesus? Because there's no sin that's so great that can't be forgiven. If only we see it in the light of who he is as opposed to who we are. You might wonder to yourself, some of you with sensitive consciences, you might say, I don't know, do I feel sorry enough about my sin for it to be godly grief? You know, I know I've sinned, I know I feel this, I feel this, but am I sorry enough? Is my sorrow deep enough to be godly grief? And I love how the old Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren says it. He says, deep enough? What for? What is the use of sorrow for sin? To lead a man to repentance and to faith. If you have as much sorrow as leads you to penitence and trust, you have enough. It is not your sorrow that is going to wash away your sin. It is Christ's blood. In other words, if you feel sorry enough about your sin that it causes you to run to Jesus for forgiveness and mercy and cleansing, that's godly grief and you've felt it deeply enough. See, worldly grief will sometimes grovel for days, for weeks, for months, for an entire lifetime over your mistakes and failures. And it produces death. But godly grief... It can be a, just a moment. The Holy Spirit saying you've gone astray and your heart's pained and you turn and you run to Jesus, the Savior, the, the, the satisfaction for that sin. Finally, a third distinction between godly grief and worldly grief is the taste, the taste. It's a weird way to describe this, but, but I hope it's helpful for you that Worldly grief is bitter. It's bitter because all we can see is the sin and the failure. And so our response to it is to minimize it, to shift it, to put it on somebody else, to, to not want to deal with it, to avoid it. 
And repentance is something that we don't like. We hate it. We don't like the word. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to do it. I want to stuff those things. I don't want to feel them. It's a, it's a bitter experience because it's all about you. You don't see Jesus in it. You just see yourself and others and how they might be thinking about you. But real godly sorrow, it's bitter because you've offended the holy God. You've sinned against the one who loved you so much he gave his only son for you that you might be set free from sin. It's bitter. There's a bitterness to it, but, but that bitterness leads you to the cross. And at the cross, there flows this sweet fountain of grace and love and provision of forgiveness that's greater than all of your sin. And so while it's bitter to own our sin, it leads us to the sweet place of forgiveness and mercy and love and reconciliation with God and with others. And repentance then isn't something that we avoid and that we we just we try not to ever do it if we don't have to, but but actually it becomes increasingly something that we're aware of. And in the moment that our hearts we feel them turned away from God, we say, Oh, forgive me. We turn back and we experience that fresh welcome. And that love again and again. You see, unless you believe that Jesus is the Savior and that the salvation he purchased for you is sufficient to cover all of your sins, that there's, that there's no sin beyond his grace and mercy, unless you believe that, you, you won't come to him. So God provides for us salvation. He provides for us a Savior and the cross and the message of the, the resurrection that we might have the confidence to be honest about our sin. We don't have to minimalize it. Christ's grace is enough. We don't have to blame somebody else for it. He already knew he paid for it as it really is. You don't have to despair. His grace is sufficient for you. That's the beauty of the cross. This is what godly sorrow does. It leads us to repentance and leads to salvation. Whereas worldly grief does not. Let's talk about the evidence of true repentance. How can you know if you've actually uh, are repenting? We see it described in verse 11 for the Corinthians. He says, see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. So they were, they were grieved by their sin, and their grief caused them to turn away from their sin and to start moving in the right direction, to start moving towards God. And that, 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 that affected a change in the way they were living. They started doing some things differently. He, he says, I, I see the evidence of your godly grief because I heard from Titus about Your zeal for me and your longing to be reconciled with me. I see your your willingness to punish the offender, to to actually do what you had failed to do before, to do the exercise church discipline. But I see you're doing that now. That's the fruit of repentance and this godly grief. He says you've, you've strove to prove yourselves innocent in the matter, not that they never did anything, but that they've owned what they've done and they've sought to turn and make it right. This is the evidence of true repentance is a changed mind, changed feelings, and changed actions. It doesn't mean that we don't stumble back into the old ways, but there's a turn. There are some counterfeits to true repentance or some things that accompany true repentance but aren't in themselves true repentance that I want to help you see. Uh, The Puritan Thomas Watson many years ago wrote a book on repentance, and and he identifies a few different counterfeits. I want to highlight two of them for you. He writes, being terrified in the face of God's law is not repentance. When you look at God's law and you hear his word and you find out that you're a sinner and that you're under his wrath and condemnation if you've not trusted in Jesus Christ, you might be terrified of the reality of hell and the coming judgment. And you should be terrified, but you shouldn't confuse that terror with repentance. It's one thing to be a terrified sinner and another to be a repenting sinner. Terrified sinners ought to become repenting sinners 
by turning from their sin and to Jesus, the provision for their sin. But don't think simply because you feel bad about breaking God's law that that is repentance. Secondly, making resolutions against sin is not repentance. Oftentimes we fail, we, make, we sin, we do things we wish we hadn't done, and we say, I'm never doing that again. I'm never doing that again. But you're not necessarily saying that. You, you, you say that not necessarily because uh, sin is sinful, but because sin is painful. I, I don't ever want to do that again because it's made my life worse. This is the addict who says, I, I don't want to keep doing this because it's ruining my life and all my relationships. And they're absolutely right. It is. Sin will ruin your life and your relationships, no matter what form it takes. But if the primary motive of dealing with it is just to simply resolve that you're not going to do it because it's making your life difficult, that's not repentance. So what then is true repentance? What does it look like? What's the evidence of it? J.I. Packer sums it up in five statements that are really helpful. You may want to take a picture of this while it's on the screen or write it down. First of all, it's realistic recognition that we have wronged God. It's an actual owning of our sin, uh, that my sin is not primarily what I've done to myself, it's what I've done to him. Secondly, and by the way, that includes not minimizing it, not shifting the blame to anybody else. This is what I did, looking it full on in the face. Secondly, regretful remorse at having dishonored God. In other words, having looked at the reality of your sin and against whom it was committed, first of all, God, and maybe somebody else too, but first of all, Him, you feel the sorrow. You wish you hadn't. You wish you could do it differently. Three, reverent requesting of God's pardon, meaning this is what I did. I wish I hadn't done it, but I can't undo it. And I can't fix it. And I can't pay it back. All I can do is cast myself on your mercy and ask forgiveness. That's Christian repentance. Not pray the rosary a certain number of times or crawl on your hands and knees up some stairs for a while, but God have mercy on me, a sinner. It's free, and we request it of him. Four, resolute renunciation of sin. Not just, I did this, and I don't like how this made me feel, but I'm probably going to do it again. It's, I did this, and I don't like how it made me feel, and I don't like what I did to the Lord, and by his grace, I never want to do this again. And I'm committed to not doing this again. And I, and I want to surround myself with people who will help me to not do this again because I don't want to grieve him with my sin. Not because I'm afraid of being cast out. No, it's not that. It's not, that's not what's driving it. It's love for him and a desire to please him and to honor him with my life that drives my renunciation of sin and my former way of being. And then fifthly, Requisite restitution to those we have hurt. We have to recognize the human dimension of our sin. We've asked for God's pardon, but we may need to ask somebody else's pardon as well whom we have sinned against. And not only maybe do we need forgiveness, but maybe we've wronged them and we need to do something to make it right. We can't pay back God for what we've done, but if we've stolen from somebody, we can pay them back. And we should. So these are the, this is what real repentance looks like. This is the evidence of real repentance. These are the components. Now, it's not going to look the same in everybody. It's not going to look the same every single time that we repent. But, but these are the common pieces. And this doesn't, this doesn't have to drag out over days or weeks. This can be just in a moment. Lord, I recognize what I've done. I'm sorry for what I've done to you. I, I don't want to do that again. And will you please forgive me for what I said to you about this thing that's it. The evidence of true repentance. If you want to see what it looks like in story form, you can read the story of David with Bathsheba and the confrontation 
by prophet Nathan. And you can read Psalm 51 where David expresses his uh, hatred for his sin and what he did and his commitment uh, to trusting in the Lord for forgiveness and to walking in obedience to him. What's the outcome of true repentance? The outcome is essentially reconciliation with God, with others, and then finally joy. Reconciliation and joy. Without repentance, there can be no reconciliation with God. There can be no reconciliation with others. There will be no lasting joy. Your salvation is not based on your repentance, but there is no salvation without repentance. And so if you're out there today and you're a person who's, I've never repented of my sin. I've never uh, turned to God away from seeking my own way and doing what I like to do. Or maybe you're, you're a Christian today, but you are, you're moving not towards him, but away from him. And maybe you've been sitting here every week, but you, your heart is moving away from him. And you're cherishing some sin in your heart and treasuring something in your heart that's, that's, that's contrary to who he is and what's good. And you just, you're moving away. Maybe you've been drifting for years. Well, the beautiful good news of the gospel is that you don't have to keep moving that way. If God is moving in your heart today, that is your prompting. That is the Holy Spirit at work in you saying, turn around. Come home. Come back. It it may have been a years-long journey away, but it's just a moment to turn around and to come back. The Bible gives us a beautiful picture of this in the story of the prodigal son. Here was a child living in his father's house with everything good to enjoy. And he took those good gifts and he went off into the far country and he squandered it all in sinful and riotous living. Made a total mess of his life. Found himself bankrupt, face down in the pigsty, envying the pigs for their food. Maybe you know what that feels like. And he found himself in that miserable place and he said, you know what, the servants in my father's house have it better than I do. Maybe I can go back there. And maybe he'll at least let me be a servant in his house. And so he rehearses his speech and he picks himself up and he comes home and he's he's ready to deliver the speech to his father. But his father is standing out there waiting for him. He's watching for his son to come home. And as soon as the son is within sight, the father comes running to him. And the the son starts to spit out his apology and all the things he's going to do different. and And the father just shuts his mouth up with his big hug and puts a new robe on him and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and expresses his absolute delight and joy over this son who was lost but now is found. And this is the picture God wants you to see for yourself. You might be in the far country and you might say, you know, I can't really come back. He says, he's waiting for you to come. Not to make you grovel, but to celebrate your return. And we are too. Your family. So repent. Believe the good news of what Jesus has accomplished for you, a full and final salvation. It's all been paid for. Turn from going away from him and run to him instead. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this great salvation. That even we who knowingly and willfully have sinned against you over and over again, despising cross. Yet even for us, your grace is sufficient. I pray that you would work in every heart, Lord, whether we've never turned to you or we just simply need to turn to you today. I pray that we would accept your invitation, that we would return and experience the salvation that you have purchased through Jesus, that we would be reconciled to you and to one another, and that we would experience the joy of real repentance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.